If you'd like, you could turn to Psalm 8. We're going to be looking at Psalm 8 this morning. I hope today finds you well. I'm worn out from the week, and I'm a little muddy-headed, so forgive me if I don't make a lot of sense today. I, don't, I, think, I'll, I think I'll make sense. I hope I'm making sense. Um, but if I don't, that's why. Um, anyways, uh, today it, uh, what I want to do is I want to look at Psalm 8, and um, what I want to try and encapsulate is a little bit of what we told the kids this week. And day one started with saying that they are unique people. Each, each one of these kids was unique and special, and, and God particularly made them, and there's nobody else like them. And they were made for a purpose. And that's a little bit what Psalm 8 is getting at. Psalm 8 is asking this question, what are people? What are, what are you? And the answer is not what the world will tell you. And, and what this psalm is getting at is going to talk about everything from, from racism. It deals with racism. It deals with self-esteem, body image, the environment, medical ethics, our work. It touches on almost every hot button in our world today. Not quite all, but most of them. And it talks about the significance of a human being. It articulates this foundational truth that from God's view, you are not just an animal. You are not just a collection of things that time and random chance is thrown together. You are more significant than you have ever imagined you could possibly be. And, it, and you are that not because of what you do or how you perform in various tasks. You are that because God made you that way. You didn't achieve it, so you cannot lose it. You can only distort it. You are made in God's image to declare his glory. That's what the psalm is basically saying now let's 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 walk through this the 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 the, the outline i want to kind of go through is i want to first kind of give you the basic theme of the entire sir, the whole, uh, psalm and i want to talk at the basic the heart of it in the middle of the section and then i kind of want to just think through some of the implications now the theme is is clearly articulated in verses one two and nine and one and two particularly form what's called an inclusio an inclusio is a literary technique used um, in various places but in the bible it's seen quite frequently it's where you when you have this this unit of literary a literary unit and on either side of it you have a repeated phrase and you can see it quite clearly in psalm 1 verse psalm 8 verse 1 o lord our lord how majestic is your name in all the earth and then flip to verse 9 o lord our lord how majestic is your name in all the earth it's like bookends and what it's supposed to do the, the, the idea is it is if you understand these two outside things, everything in between is meant to be considered in light of this ex, this la, these these things on the outside. It like envelops it. Consider what's being said in the middle in light of what's being said on the outside. And so let's start with this beginning, this inclusio, um, and give, give which will give us the basic theme of the entire psalm our lord our lord how majestic is your name in all the earth now that's actually not repeated he's not saying lord lord twice it's what it says but it's not what it quite means exactly the first one if you notice in most of your bibles that first lord is capitalized which as i've talked about recently capitalized in in when the, when the the publishers do this it's because the hebrew word is actually the personal name of god yahweh and that 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 is signifying the god of the exodus the god who keeps his covenant the god who's who who's the god of abraham and isaac and jacob and moses it's it's the specific god of the old testament in relation to israel it's a personal name and then the second one is not capitalized, if you notice, and that one simply means ruler. It's so he's talking about the God of Israel, our personal God who is our king. And this is something that the Bible does quite frequently, as you see here. It's not talking about God in general, but he, it gets really nitpicky specific. 
In our own day and culture, it's the difference between praying to the God of all understanding versus praying in Jesus' name. It gets really nitpicky because the Bible was written in a time and place where there were lots of different ideas of what, who God is and what gods are. You think we have lots of different gods in our society? Not compared to this day. And they're, they're speaking into this. And so the psalmist is being very, very specific. This is the God of Genesis, the creation, the one who is our creator. Who, what does he say about him? It begins by simply saying, how majestic is your name? Now, majesty is a word we're relatively familiar with. It talks about kingliness. It's superior. It's glorious. It's the idea of this exceedingly great, powerful, and grand. We think of like Mount Hood as majestically towering over Portland. It's, that's the concept, the visual image of this great and powerful and significant creature. That's what God is. This is what he's declaring, the greatness of God. Honored, elevated, grand, and dignified. You can't be undignified and majestic at the same time that's the idea dignity and where do we see this this med, this majesty the majestic is his name now the name in the when we talk about the name in the bible it's not referring to the the, the few syllables that refer to someone. So if you're trying to get, let's say, Justin's name, his attention, you would say, hey, Justin. That's not what this means. It's not those, those vocal sounds that you would use to get someone's attention. It's referring to all that a person is. And we use that in our society with such phrases as, uh, don't drag my name through the mud. You know, it's, it, it's referring to who the person is, the very essence of who they are and all that they represent. It's a little bit like, like when we talk about the White House. We don't mean necessarily that, that street, out, street address in, 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 in Washington, D.C., but we mean all that it represents. That's the idea with this. So when it's saying how majestic is your name, he's saying how majestic is who God is. His reputation, his significance, the core of who God is, is glorious. It's dignified. It's exalted. That's what he's, and, and we can see that exaltation in all the earth. Not just in one particular place, but everywhere. It's what Psalm 19 talks about. That the glory of God is being di displayed in all the heavens. It's this idea that God can be seen everywhere. Now, once in a while in the Bible, when it talks about uh, in the land or the earth, which is the same word translated in various places, I mean, sometimes it means someplace local, but not in this case. In this case, it's clearly meant to be encompassing of all of creation. And you can tell that by if you just drop down for just a moment in verse 3, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, clear the moon and the stars which you've set in place, Clearly, the psalmist, who in this case is David, is not just considering a particular place. He's considering all of creation, all of the, all of the, the created realm, whether it's in, in Jerusalem or, or Pompeii or Hong Kong or Portland, everywhere. And not just here on this planet. In this case, he's considering all of the cosmos, all the different universes, all the places in the universe. How glorious, how majestic is your name in all of that place. God is great. He is glorious. It is seen everywhere. Now, if you, if you could can imagine this, I could see David sitting out, um, looking up at the stars and writing this. You can see the, the, the great span of the, of the heavens. And if you've never taken a moment to go out in, in a place where there's no lights and it's a clear sky and really seen the stars in all its glory. In Portland, it's really hard to do that because of all the lights and then the, the clouds. But if you've ever had that moment where you've been able to really see the stars, you'll never forget it. It's glorious, and that's what David is seeing. It's so amazingly big. But David didn't even realize how significant it was, did he? 
See, today we, we, we know more. We know what all those stars are. We can see um, that as we think about them, you know that there's a, a vast span be, between them. And then each one of those is various colors. And there's, there's, there's Neptune has one color and Saturn has another color. And, and then there's the rings of Saturn and there's so much. But you know, our problem is, as modern men, we know just enough to lose the wonder. Just enough to lose the wonder and not enough to appreciate it. Because it's really hard to, to really mentally grasp that it would take a lifetime just to get out of our, so, our solar system. The, the, the heavens are so much bigger and grander than even David realizes. But it's nevertheless still the case. Now I'm pounding this little piece home because this is the theme, is the greatness of God, the glory of God. And it, as modern man, we can see more of what that means. It is so high that it's hard for a human being to grasp. It's so high and it is so amazing and it is also obvious. Look at verse 2 very briefly. Out of the mouth of of babies and infants you have established strength some of your versions say praise because of your foes to still the enemy of the avenger there's a little bit of a, in, a translation issue here some translations put strength some of them put um praise the word is related to each other um when we when we when this is quoted in the new testament they put uh praise in this case the point i think is is, is that God is using infants, little toddlers, to silence his adversaries. And that's how Jesus actually quotes this. And have you ever tried to argue with a toddler? <laughs> you can, and it often just ends up with, well, I just said so. <laughs> because they, you, it, it, it's very hard to argue with them, especially when they do this. When they state what is utterly obvious. And you've seen that. It's what the shows like Kids Say the Darndest Things are about. They'll say something that is so clearly obvious. Now, they may not understand all the full implications of it, but they'll say something as awkward as, You've gained weight, haven't you? <laughs> and how do you argue with that? Mm, yeah, I'd have. And that's the issue. And that's how it, it's used by Jesus in the New Testament. Is he sitting there pro proclaiming amazing miracles, and, this, and, and the Pharisees are saying he's not the Messiah, and these little kids are running around praising God, and Jesus is saying they can tell, they know it's obvious, and so they're praising God for Jesus. The point here is the same point. God's glory is not only high and majestic and glorious and all of that, and it's everywhere, but it is absolutely obvious. You've got to be educated out of this to not see it. You really do. And, our, and, our, and, and, and you've got to really work hard to not know that God created the world. But we do this. We, get all, we grow up and we get all complicated in our head, but the little ones can just look at the world with all that wonder and go, obviously somebody made this. God's glory is obvious. God's glory is everywhere and it is absolutely high and majestic. This is the theme of this psalm. And we can see it in verse 1 and it ends in the same way in verse Verse 9, 1 and 9, all is saying the same thing. God's glory is everywhere. It's greater than everything and everyone, and it is obvious. But here's the, here's the point. That middle section is meant to be read in light of that. And we get to that when we come here in verse 4, where he says, what is man, what is people that you think about him? God's glory is so amazing, and so he turns and looks at people and goes, what is going on with this? It's not really a question as more of a stunned shock. It's like, I can't believe, God, that you're thinking of people. It's this stunned uh, idea of, wait a minute. What are, what are you doing here, God? 
these two words, mindful and care. Mindful has to do with this idea of um, a beh- God has given particular thought to human beings. He, he's thought carefully about them. And this idea of care means he's given particular attention to them. He's giving particular care and particular thought and particular attention to people. Why is it? See, he's reading this. This whole, this whole psalm is in context of this big sense of God's glory, but also in this concept found in the beginning of Genesis, Genesis 1, verses 26, 27, and chapter 2, verse 4. Flip over there real quick, because we're going to spend a moment there. Genesis chapter 1. This whole psalm is really a commentary on what's happening in Genesis 1. God, in the beginning of of Genesis, starting at at 1-1, starts talking about how he's creating all the things, and creating the lights and the heavens, just like he's been talking about up to this point in the psalm. And then he gets down here in verse 26 and says, Now God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and the and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. People are made in the image of God. And this, this, is, this, this, this creation story is repeated in chapter 2. And this is not two different creations. It's not two different authors. It's a literary technique that's used actually quite frequently in the Bible where they will say something and then they're going to repeat it another time with a slightly different twist. Theologians call it, use the phrase, repetition without redundancy. And that's what's happening here. It's like stereo, looking at a single event from two different angles so that together you get a fuller sense of what's happening. And so God restates the creation of man in chapter 2. And we can see that. Where is it? Thank you. See? Verse 4. Oh, my heart. I am so... Verse 7 is where we need to focus. Thank you. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust and the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And he goes on and he creates Eve as well. And, and the point is, is if, if when we look at verse 7, notice how, how much attention he's giving to, to people here. This is not just spiritual. Speaking and the world is cre- and, and people are created. No, he gets down, he gets dirty, he gets into the mud, and he's actually forming a person. He's paying particular attention to people. They're different than all the other creation. And 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 so you have these two, and he's paying particular attention, particular ideas, and what's what's being communicated here is that God is that the people are different. There's a distinction between God and all creation. God is not a part of the created order. He's distinct. And just in a similar way, human beings are different than everything else that God ever created. We're different. And that is a distinction that we need to hear today in a society that's blurring the lines, that communicates that there's really no difference between the death of a seal and the death of a baby. There's a huge difference. Not that we shouldn't be upset about that. I'm going to get to that in a moment about the death of a seal. But we need to hear that you are not animals. You are not just things. You're something very unique. And that's what the core of what's being communicated here and in Psalm 8. You're different. And in particularly, how are you different? That verse 27 of chapter 1, you are created in the image of God. Now, image is not something that's terribly complicated i think i know theologians throw that thing around all over the, all over the place i really don't think it's all that complicated particularly today with our new technologies it's one of the places where i think technology has helped us back in those days they didn't know what a picture was very well but we know what an image is an image is simply a representation of an event or a person or a thing when you look at a picture of 
of your wife or your husband or your child. You know it's not their, the, the actual person, but it says who they are. It describes them. It, it, it means something. Just like the image of, like, say, a, fl- a flag is an image for the United States. It, it, it represents them. That's what an image is. It's not that complicated. And it's what Jesus is getting at, I think, in John 14, 9, who, is the, who later in, in Hebrews is going to be described as the exact image, the perfect image of God. And in, Genesis, in John 14, Jesus is talking to Philip, and he says to him, Philip, you've been with me for three years. You know me. And if you know me, you've seen the Father. The idea is, is if you know who Jesus is, you know what the Father is. Because Jesus has clearly, most perfectly explained, shown to the world what God the Father is like. He's a perfect image. You know what God's like by looking at Jesus. And that's what an image is. And what does all this mean? Is that you were made to perfectly communicate to the world, to all of creation, what God is like. And that is not something that you have earned. That is not something you've, you've done because of some achievement you've made. You're born with it. It is baked right into being a human being. You are distinct in this way from all of creation. All of creation reflects God. I look at my dog, and he is, he's amazing, and there are certain pieces of him that I can see God's love and his, his love and enjoyment of me and life better than I, ha- I do in very most human beings. But can he communicate in the fullest sense what God's like? No, only a person can do that. And so when we come back here to verse Verse 4 and 5 in Psalm 8. What is, what is man that you're mindful? What is the son of man that you care for him? He's looking at this incredible glory of God and he's asking this stunned question, how is it that you have decided to make people so that we can have the incredible ability to communicate to all of creation what you're like, God? Verse 5, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings or angels or God. There's another interpretive issue there. And crowned him with glory and honor. This issue with heavenly beings or angels or God. For the sake of time, I'm going to... The actual Hebrew word is Elohim, which is typically, frequently translated as God. And it might mean God in this case. It's unclear. In the New Testament, it's it's typically translated when they translate this this particular and they do translate this particular passage, they put angels in that case. I don't think whether it's angels or God is the key idea here. And if you'd like, I can walk you through why some translations have put heavenly beings, some have put angels, some have put God. The point is, is that God has made us, crowned us with glory and honor, attributes of God. He has, de- he has decided to bestow on all humanity glory and honor. That we, are, we have been given You don't get to crown yourself. The world won't crown you with the glory and honor of God. God can do that, and he has. Does the queen earn it? No. Can she disgrace it? Yeah. But she doesn't earn it. Did Prince William earn the title of prince? No. But he has it. By his birth, by his birth alone, he has it. And as a king, as as royalty, 
We have, a, we have a kingdom. Verse 6, 7, and 8 describe our kingdom. You have given him dominion, which means this, 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 this idea of rulership over all the works of his hands, all the things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and everything that passes along of the seas. The point is very clear. As you can hear, you can hear Genesis 1 here, can't you? The idea is that God has given rulership to all of creation to people. And so what's the point of this intersection, this, 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 this teaching? If the theme of the, whole sec, of the whole psalm is God's incredible, massive, high, exalted glory, the, 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 the point he's trying to make is, is in light of that, what is people that you have decided to give us a majesty like that you see as as great as God's glory is your majesty is in in accordance to that see if you're a you're a king of a of a tiny little kingdom it doesn't really matter right I mean yeah you're a king okay yeah it's like being first in your class but you have three people in your class who cares, right? But if you're the first, if you're the valedictorian of, let's say, the class in Oxford, okay, that matters. See, God is the, God's kingdom is over everything. His glory is higher than everything. Your majesty, majesty must be seen in light of that because you were designed to reflect that glory. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. Nothing. You were, just, you were created to reflect it. It's one thing to be the, 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 the picture of a two-year-old, as amazing as that would be for a parent, versus a picture from Michelangelo. See, we're more like a picture from Michelangelo. There's an inherent significance to that, and that's what you are. And this gets us to this whole point here of, of what are the implications? If God is extremely majestic, then so are we. Not because we've earned it, but because of our birth. If God's majest, majesty is greater than all the heavens, how great must be ours who are designed to reflect that glory, to mirror it. It has to be extreme, to say the least. And so here are the implications. If you mistreat God's image, God takes it personally. There are no average human beings and this extends to everyone male female whether they're one years old or 101 they all have the exact same significance di dignity and respect and honor that they should be shown it doesn't matter if they are right white black yellow it doesn't make any difference what race they are this obliterates racism this is god's stance on racism right here any mistreatment of someone because of race is an offense to God. It obliterates all this idea of, of, of classism. There's no, just because the queen has more su subjects doesn't make her any more dignity, having more dignity or value or significance than a bum on the streets in Portland. They're both made in the image of God. It doesn't matter what, what, what sin they do. They can deface that image. But just because they do a sin that we per personally find it disturbing, it doesn't change that they still are a, are, are a being of great dignity and majesty. Because we don't lose the image of God out of sin. We can blur it. We can mess it up but we still have it. All genders, all IQs. doesn't matter if you have an IQ of one or an IQ of 201. You still have the same dignity and respect should be given to you as a significant person. You want, you want, you want a Christian view of, of, of self-esteem? This is it. 
It doesn't matter if you if you if you're a garbage man or a CEO of, of a company. You are amazingly and wonderfully made. You are you are a king and queen. You were designed to be a ruler of the cosmos by God. And you can't lose that because you didn't earn it. This is why this is why David's just utterly stunned. He considers the incredible glory of God and that we all human beings, whether Israelites or Philistines, and he's going, you made us to do what? To reflect your glory? And when we abuse another human being, God takes it personal. In Matthew 5.22, Jesus specifically deals with this very issue. This is why he has this, 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 this quote which we often downplay, but it's a big deal. He's going through and he's, he's explaining the full sense of the law and what's good and, and bad. And in 5.22, he starts with this. You have said of old, thou shall not murder, and whoever murders is liable to judgment. This is the reason why murder is bad biblically. Because to murder a human being is not just to end the life of someone, it's to end. It's, it's an attack on God's image. It's equivalent of why a Marine would get so upset at someone burning a flag. He takes it personal. God takes it personal when you abuse a human being because that human being represents himself. And then he continues, but I say to one, anyone who is angry at his brother is liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell, hell of fire. Now, some, one translation puts it this way. It says, anyone who says to his brother, you moron. And that's the idea. He's looking at another human being and, and insulting him, not just in general his behavior, but he's, he's saying he's not that significant. He's, he's worthless. And God, you don't do that because you're saying that of my image. It's why abuse in any form of any kind is always wrong. You're abusing God's image. And how have we done as human beings? I'm, I'm trying to move. This is the implications part. We're kind of, kind of bringing it to the end here. How have we done as a human race? Not well. Whether it's the environment, why, why should we take care of the environment? Because it reflects God's glory as well. And as his Im image and people who are meant to, to rule over this, we are supposed to take care of it, but we don't. Why, why is there racism? Because we don't do this. We constantly, in, in, in re over and over, as Romans 3.23 puts it, we fall short of the glory of God. We don't reflect God's glory as we were meant to. And as a human race, we're suffering for it. And all of creation suffers because of our mismanagement of it. Even though that's exactly what God intended. Whether it's we're talking about the human race as a whole, or we're talking about us each, each, each one of us individually. And so, is God's plan ruined? Is God just sitting back going, man, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I gave humanity such amazing abilities, such honor and dignity, and look what they've done to it. No. No. He's not. His plan will not be ruined. This passage is actually quoted. Psalm 8 is quoted in, Ma in Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, the writer in, in verse 5 begins to quote it. Now, verse 6. It's been testified somewhere. He's scratching his head. He knows where it's at, but he's, you know, the point isn't necessarily a reference. 
What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a, a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. See, you can hear Psalm 8, right? He's quoting it. This is, and he begins to comment on it. Now, in verse, the, the second half of verse 8, now in putting everything in subjection to him, that is to people, he left nothing outside of his control. God left nothing outside of people's control. And at present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. Isn't it obvious that creation doesn't want to listen to us? It's like a dog who's been abused. Does the dog who's abused want to listen to their master? But you treat them right, and they'll be happy to. But the re- creation rebels against us because we are not okay, because we, we don't treat it right. And so it's this, this, this elephant in the room that we all just a moment ago said that we're not right. The world isn't right. People aren't right. And God is going, but I'm going to fix this. And we con- he continues on in verse 9. But, and lots of good things come after that word in the Bible. But we do see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. See, what he's getting at here is that humanity messed it all up. But Jesus who from eternity has always been perfect and he set that glory aside to become a human being to fully enter into this mess. And for a little while he was made just like us. And he took on all of our our death, which is, is, a, is a big word in the Bible to just describe all of the mess that we've made and the consequences of it. And he took all of that on, and through his death and resurrection, he is ushering into existence a brand new creation, a new race. The first Adam and Eve messed it up, but the new Adam, Jesus, is restoring that. And in his resurrection, it's the first taste of the restored humanity, this restored world. Jesus, as we see him, is how we are meant to be. And one day we will. We are meant to live like the perfect man, Jesus. And he will make it. He will make it one day. It won't happen through education. It will not happen through technology. It will not ha- happen through social justice. How will God achieve the world being the way it's supposed to be? Through his strong arm, through his death and resurrection of Jesus. He will make it happen one day. That is how the world is meant to be. God's glory is great, it is everywhere, and it is particularly meant to be seen in human beings. And one day, through Jesus, it will fully be seen in all of those who have put their faith in him. All those who said, I know I have not lived the way I'm supposed to. I want to be. Make me like you, Jesus. Wash me away of the sin that I've done, the, 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 the not living up to the way I'm supposed to be. Clean that. See, Jesus had to take on not only our God-ordained body, but our God-ordained judgment because we blew it so that we can have that removed and we can get his God-ordained righteousness that we can be what we were intended to be. If you want that, trust in Jesus, and one day you will be all that you were meant to be. You, are, you will be the great and amazingly glorious creature that God has always wanted you to be. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for this day and for this VBS. I want to thank you for these people here. I want to thank you for the incredible privilege you've given to us as human beings. Forgive us of the ways that we have not lived up to that image, the way we've distorted it, the way we have abused it, the way we've turned it into something ugly. Make us like you, Jesus. We long for the day, creation in us all long for the day. We groan for the day in which one day 
you will reveal us to be all that we were meant to be. And we trust in your death and resurrection to make that happen. In Jesus' name, amen.